I'm going to be talking about today is idolatry. And if you don't know what that means, kids, I will explain it. Um, but I want us the entire time to be keeping in mind this prayer that, or not this prayer, but this statement about God that's found in Deuteronomy, defining how the people of God are to relate to God and who God is. The Lord is one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and your strength. With all your strength. See, King James was finding its way through my, my memory. So what we're going to talk about is idolatry. And what idolatry is, and um, idolatry is when we worship something that's other than God. Okay? And in ancient times, and in some cultures today, uh, what we mean by idolatry is you actually have an idol or a statue or a sculpture or something that you either say represents God or say is God, and then you worship it. So the same way people worship, or we worship Jesus and God, people worship these these idols, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Because I'm going to paraphrase a whole chunk of the Old Testament really quick, just so you know where we're at. Because what we're going to be talking about is King Josiah, and that story is found in 2 Kings um, 22 and 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. So it's like this parallel story. And they, they, they get the... Um, the order might is kind of cataloged slightly differently. We're going to kind of follow the Second Kings version, um, but it's the same stuff, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. But um, I'm going to give you a quick paraphrase of just so you understand where we are. So um, God has started this mission to save the world and bring restoration to all things, which will lead to the coming of Jesus, the great King of Israel, the Messiah of the world, who we worship today. Okay, but He started by getting Abraham and saying, you are the guy that I'm going to do this through. And then he made his people, which was Israel, or somebody says Jewish person, that's the same thing. And so he has these people, that, and he makes a covenant with them, and then they move, and then it goes through a whole thing. And then he ends up taking them to uh, the land that they're going to inhabit, which is Israel, and they have, um, they live there, and there's a lot of things I'm leaving out. You need to go back and read <laughs> in the Bible. Um, and we've talked about in the past. But so they have their... Their, their place, they're living, they have God, and they have the presence of God with them and all this kind of thing. And then they say, God, we want a king. Like all these other people around us have a king. He's like, no, no, I'm the king. And they go, no, we want a king. Like you have these judges, we, don't, we want king so that we can have a king like they have a king. He's like, it's not going to work really well. And they go, we want it anyway. And so God does it. And then you see that this starts to have the kings of Israel exist. And then they start to do bad things because God gives them a list of um, like, here, like this, like the, in the... Uh, Deuteronomy, like, here's how we're going to live together. I'm God, you're the people, and I love you, you love me, and we work together. But that was difficult because life was happening, just like life's happening now. And so the kings start to doubt that or start to question it, and then they start to fight with each other, and then they start to take things from each other, and then they start to compromise. And the people in the cultures around them, they go, well, I have this other God, so maybe we should worship him. They go, yeah, let's bring that in. And then they kind of say, and God's like, no, 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 no. Like, God is in other places, he's like, you don't do that. I'm God. All this stuff isn't. Don't mix in with that. And they go, yeah, we get it. And then they don't. And then the kings start to fight. And then they're, now there's two kings and the kingdom gets divided. And it's not going well, okay? To the point that God's like, I'm going to have to take these people, these special people that I've called now, and I'm going to have to take them out of this land and kind of into exile is what we call it, to kind of get a reset going. Like we need to start, not start over, but we need to kind of clean this up. And he's very, God is very angry about this. He's like, this is not okay because they're doing a lot of bad things. Okay, so we find a situation now. You got God's enacted this plan. People have gotten involved. We, you know, they kind of, things haven't gone that great. And now the kingdom's divided. There's two kingdoms and they're, you know, it's, it's kind of a mess. And then, listen to me, kids. An eight-year-old kid becomes the king of Judah. Like, think about that. Would you want to be king when you're eight? Might sound kind of cool. <laughs> but you have a lot of responsibilities. And so we find the story in 2 Kings 22 and 23, 2 Chronicles 34, 35. See, now Kings and Chronicles are basically just writing down what all these different kings were doing. And most of it's bad. You know, King David did good. A lot of the other guys did bad. 
this guy does good. His name is Josiah, and he's eight years old when he gets in charge of everything. That's crazy. And what it says is that um, he's eight when he becomes king, and then he's in when he's 16. So eight years later, he starts really seeking God. So he's still, a, he's still young, but he's like, starts seeking God and starts, um, you know, we got this temple. We need to fix this up. Like, this is God's temple now, and it's kind of a mess. So they, you know, they have a way, which is all defined, how they're supposed to kind of take money that people give, and they keep the temple going. And God's presence, this temple represents God's presence on earth, okay? Like the actual presence of God. And there's, it's, it's uh, an entire complex that God himself has designed and asked for them to build, Okay? And it's kind of a mess right now. And he's like, guys, we need to fix this up. So they start fixing it up. And they're like, yeah, you're probably right. We need to do that. And he's like, this place where we meet with God needs to be fixed up. Okay? They start doing that. And while they're doing that, they find this scroll. It's the book of the law. Because they lost it. So you have God himself has given people a special job. And he's given them, he's wrote down, they've written down the laws to how to do that. And they lost them. So they didn't have them anymore. So they were figuring it out and it wasn't going very well. But Josiah doesn't necessarily know this because he just shows up. He's, he's eight years old. He becomes the king. And when you grow up in a place where things aren't going so well, you don't always know. Okay? So he doesn't know. But they find it like, hey, we found this book of the law. And he goes great, let's hear that. And they start reading it to him. And it includes like that piece I just told you, you know. And his reaction is not good. He's like, oh my gosh. It says he tore his clothes because he's so upset. He's like, we're not doing any of this stuff. And so he kind of freaks out a little. And he's like, we need to start dealing with the situation. And as he starts to look around at what he sees going on, compared to what he reads we should be doing, that ain't it. You see the title now. <laughs> so he's looking around at what is happening, and he's comparing it to what he's reading should be happening, and he's like, that ain't it. And we need to fix that. So this is what he does. He goes around all these towns, and it lists them off. He goes to all these different towns and all these different places, and he takes down all these idols, because they put idols everywhere. You know, like, we don't worship God anymore. We worship this other God, or this imaginary God, or we want to credit this other thing, or we're distracted. We're doing this other stuff. He's like, no, 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 and he rips all this stuff down, and it gives pretty good detail of what he does, and it's pretty intense, and he cleans it all out, and he, and he starts over, like, we're, no, no, we're going to start over, and look, we need to be celebrating Passover, these other things, and they do this, they do it, like, and, and, He cleans everything up and he fixes it, right? He cleans out the idols, okay? So so here's what I want us to get from this. Because this can get kind of complicated, so bear with me. We, we, We all live in a culture, okay? And if you go to a different place in the world, they may have a different culture than we do. Okay, so if you're in um, America, it might be, I didn't, I didn't think of a list of these things, but like the way, like we drive around in cars mostly in Jacksonville, you know. You could even go to other parts of America, like New York City, and most people don't have cars, there's a lot more people there. So they're like, well, we don't, ha- we don't have room for all our cars, so we ride on the subway train more. You go, wow, this is different. So now in the morning when these kids get up and go to school, they might get up with their parents and walk down the street and get on a subway train and ride a train to school and then get off. That's just a little different. So their daily life is a little different than ours, you know. Now, if you go to another country, like... Um, like the Netherlands or something, they may be like, well, we ride bikes a lot over here. And you go, I have a bike. And you're like, no, like my dad rides a bike to work every day. And you go, wow, my dad drives 45 minutes because it takes 45 minutes to get anywhere in Jacksonville to work every day. And you're like, well, my dad rides a bike to work every day. And you're like, well, that's different, you see. And 
these are just little differences, but you can get to where there's big differences, to where, you know, what you think is important is different than what this person thinks is important. And it can actually, you know, Jeff talks about sometimes like missionaries that will move from America to another country. They have to learn how people think there because what we consider rude, like that's rude, you know, isn't necessarily rude in some other places. And what they do, we might consider rude. We're like, whoa. But it's really not the same thing. You have to learn how other people think. Now, taking that and adding not just distance, meaning like I went to another country, but adding lots of time also can confuse us as well. Because like our culture might say, you know, men and women talk to each other this way, and that's polite. And then you could even be in America, but read about 200 years ago and hear men and women talking to each other, and you're like, this is very weird. Like, I don't do this, you know. Or you think of, like, knights and stuff and all the chivalry. And something. Like some of this stuff is like, we don't do all this stuff the same way anymore, you see. Now, if you want to add distance and time, you can find the kind of culture we're talking about here. So when you look at something like idols, you might go, wow, I'm really glad we don't do that because... That would be bad. And what you're, sounding, sound, what you're saying sounds bad, and doing that kind of thing is bad, and I'm glad we don't do it, and thank God, let's move on. And that would be missing the entire point of what I'm trying to say. Because here's, here's what I think. Idolatry, if it's, if, if it's like what I'm saying, is worshiping anything other than God, our culture does this all the time. All the time. The problem is we don't have the little statues anymore. See, like back in this culture and still in some cultures in the world, you'll go and they'll have a statue that either represents or in their mind is the God they're worshiping in their house or something. So you could walk in and go, oh, you worship this God because I can see the statue here. You see, we don't have the statues anymore, but we deal with the exact same thing. Now it's just hidden. Okay. Once we hit kind of the enlightenment period, we kind of try to delete a lot of this stuff. And now the idols are still around. We just don't have the actual figurine anymore, okay? Which I actually think is worse. When you just look up a straight-up definition, I'm not talking about like in a Bible dictionary. I'm talking about like Oxford English Dictionary. This is what it describes idolatry as. Extreme admiration, love, and reverence for something or someone. So that... Their definition doesn't have any sort of morality to it. It's just kind of a definition of this is that activity. An extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. Now, we would say it's okay to have extreme love and admiration and reverence for God. But many of us and our culture idolizes plenty of other things that we give Tons of extreme admiration and love and reverence to. We just don't know it's called idolatry anymore. So, we walk around, or our culture walks around worshiping idols all the time. We just don't know that's what we're doing. So now we're two steps back. Not only are we worshiping idols, we don't even know we're worshiping idols. You see? So this is the culture we're in. So let me keep going, and then I'm going to start to break this down. So just to help people think, like, what... Could that be? What, are an, what is an idol in our culture? What are idols? Um, it's anything that you give this type of devotion to because that thing becomes a god to you. Okay? Um, in 1 John 2.16, you see this kind of description. I think this is a helpful guide to finding idols. You're like, well, what is an idol? I, I'm still not quite grasping it. He describes this category of things of the world. And he, sa- he describes it like this, 1 John 2, 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes, from, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So if you're wanting to see, like, well, what, what fits in this category now in our context? Because we don't, like, back then, and if you read through the story in Second Kings and everything, and Chronicles and all, Second Chronicles, they list off the specific idols he's tearing down. This idol this idol, this idol. And they have names, as if like personalities, like names, okay? And so the names now are impersonal, 
But they're quite there. And I would argue that it's, this is a good way to figure out what they are. Things that are the lust of the flesh. You get a lot of what I'm saying there. The lust of the eyes, the things you have to have that you can't live without. And the pride of all the things you have. And the pride of all that sort of who you are and that kind of thing. And I would summarize it another way. Um, generally, these idols, because here's the thing. The idols back then were often tied to um, powers. Like you would have a god of war. Like you even hear this. Like if kids, if you study some of the uh, Greek gods and stuff, which they had a bunch, a whole bunch. And they would, they would all have almost like jobs. Like, well, this is the god of war, and this is the god of love, and this is the god, you see? And, you know, these names stick around like you've heard of them. I mean, like we named our planets after a bunch of them and stuff like that. So um, those powers are still at play now. And generally, I would put them in kind of three big categories. There may be more. This is, this is I just wrote this. <laughs> so we might be able to refine it better. But, again, it, lo- using like the category of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, a pride of life, I would say that they fit kind of in three major categories that I see that the idols of our culture are we involve power in some way or money in some way, or sex in some, some way. I think those are three areas where we are, um, our culture is worshiping idolatry. And here's the thing, because this postmodern kind of environment we find, where like people can have their own truth, your truth, my truth, this kind of thing, it makes this like rife. So now, now, we've got three steps. One, there's idol worship throughout our culture. Two, we don't even know that's what it is anymore. And three, even if we do recognize it, it doesn't really matter because that's just what you choose. It's not what I choose. It doesn't matter, you see? So you can have your God. I have my God. It's cool. You know, you want to worship that thing. I don't know what it is, you know. And I want to worship this thing. That's cool. You see? So that's a mess. And that ain't it. When you compare that to, Hero O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is God here, you see? You know? And this ain't that, you know? So we find ourselves um, confused. And so I was listening in uh, this discussion about our culture and what we that, that this kind of environment now. So we've got an environment. We've got our culture now, as I've described it, which I think is pretty close to accurate. We could probably get better if we had some more time, but, you know... Idol worshiping, don't know it's idol worshiping, and it doesn't matter if it is because who cares? It doesn't matter. And increasingly secular, so it means like we're just using these words like God and stuff, but we don't really believe in God because we, you know, that's silly or whatever it is. That's the culture. That's not what we believe, but that's the world we find ourselves in, okay? Well, I was listening to this discussion. There's a missionary slash theologian named Leslie Newbegin in the last century who was in India for, he was, he's British. He goes to India as a missionary for like 40 years. Then he comes back to England in like the 70s. And he goes, whoa, this is like way different than when I left, you know. And he was theological, so he's going, huh. I mean, he was, he was not happy about it, so don't, here, I'm, not, I'm characterizing his kind of, you know. He's like, this culture now, like the culture that literally sent me as a missionary now I'm coming back to and finding a culture that almost doesn't believe in God. and Or even the ones that do say they believe in God, they're like filled with doubt all the time. He's like, this is very confusing to me how that happened. So I want to figure that out. And also, what do I do now trying to reach this culture? Because this culture is, you know, it's like when I'm, like I said, when you're moving from one culture to another, you've got to learn how they act and how they think and what they're doing so that you can properly explain things. So he had to do that. When he goes to India, he has to learn what is it like in India and how is it different than what I learned and is there culture and language and things I need to learn so I can interact properly. And then he comes back to England where he's supposed to be from and he's like, I have to do this again. Like, now these people are so different. I can't just go, okay, I'll just go back to normal. He's like, now this is, he's like, whoa. So it caused him to start to think. And so the latter part of his life, he wrote a whole lot about secularism and Christianity and how we can exist in our culture now and all this kind of stuff. And the more I'm reading it, the more I'm like, this stuff is awesome. But he, he predicted something that would happen, and this is what I really want to hit on today. He said that this increasing move towards secularism, secularism meaning like world without God, you know, 
maybe a world full of idols, but they're not, you know, we don't really believe in that stuff. It's just affecting everyone, but we don't really believe it. You know, this is the, the world he felt like he was in. He goes, that's been increasingly happening in America and in England where he was. And he's like, but he's like, this isn't going to work because people need meaning in their life. Like, he's like, I think we're hardwired by God with eternity in our hearts to go, there's a God out there somewhere. And things matter because he says they matter. And he was even watching how, like, there was a lot of, poli- like, a lot of movements that were happening that were saying, like, you know, human rights, okay? These human rights, the people who were talking about that first were Christian people because they're like, whoa, guys. These people are made in the image of God just like you and me. So we can't just kill them all. They, need, they have human rights because God made them. And then slowly, slowly the Christian part gets pulled out of that. And they're like, no, they just have human rights. But he's saying it, it, won't, ex- it won't last very long because there's no, like, why? You know, and so sociologists have tried to argue without God why, and sometimes it might be convincing or not. I haven't studied it at length. But he was just looking at the situation going, this is kind of a powder. It's not going to last. And so I don't want to lose everybody. But what he's, he predicted was this vacuum of meaning that secularism creates, meaning there is no God. There may be this idol thing, but it's not this, it doesn't matter anymore. It's not the same thing. He goes, you just live a nice life, be nice to people, and die. That's what life is all about. That's what the culture was saying. He's like, that's not going to work because people need meaning. And he predicted that um, people would find that meaning in political religions. Where they would start to devote themselves with religious adoration, or as we would call idolatry from this definition here, extreme admiration, love, and reverence for something or someone. They would start... You, we're made to worship God. It's built in. It's hardwired. This is what he's thinking. And you're going to find something to worship. It's going to be an idol. But he's like, I think the biggest thing is going to be politics. So that you're going to start to, in this environment, religiously devote yourself to your political views. He predicted this in the 70s and 80s. And I think we're living in it right now. And I think it makes sense when you look at the community that we live in and you look at the meaninglessness that people are living with, it makes sense that they're, this in, they're angry in this passion because they have nothing else to be passionate about. Because you know, everybody knows, even people who aren't believers know, a bigger car ain't going to do it or a bigger house. You know, it's like we all kind of, like, yeah, we lie to ourselves. And then, I mean, even completely ungodly movies tell you, it's like, yeah, money's not it, guys. You know, I mean, you don't have to go to the Bible for that. It's in the Bible, and that's where I think that comes from. I think it's Christian, if you follow what I mean. But even non-believers know that. But there's still a vacuum of meaning. And we fall into what I think he predicted was this passion in politics. And I think it makes sense out there. I don't think it makes sense in here. So let me tell you, this is the main point I want everyone to see. And I want to just read this. This is Josiah now. I told you, he gets, he hears what they should be doing, he realizes they're not, and he goes throughout the whole country tearing down all these idols. Well, you want to know where he finds some? Look at this. 2 Kings 23, 4-7. I'm going to read all of it. The king ordered Hilkiah, the high priest, meaning the high priest of God, okay? The high priest the priests next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple all the articles made for, for Baal and Asherah and all the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of, Kid, of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem. Those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, and to the constellations and the starry host. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. 
He ground it to powder and he scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord. And the quarters where the women did weaving for Asherah. The thing that struck me as I read this was not just the culture was corrupt. But it was in the temple of God. These holy places like of a holy people set apart for a holy job by God in the most holy building that God has told them to build where His presence is to rest. The temple of God, that is where the stuff is. It's also all these other places, but that is where the, the stuff is. And this is what we have to worry about. Out there, they're going to devote themselves to it. And it makes sense. I think Leslie Newbegin is right. It makes sense for them to do so. It doesn't make it right. It just makes sense. Like, we can understand it. You don't have anything to believe in. Believe in something. It might be wrong. Whatever. But, you know, we want to reach them with the Lord. But it makes no sense for us to be doing it. And here's what's dangerous about it. I was reading about some of these gods, okay? I listed them. They said Baal, Baal then there's Molech, then there's Asherah. Like, what do we know about these? And, the, you know, historians and archaeologists, they know stuff. But I found something that, again, st- stuck out to me about Asherah. This was a local goddess of the area. And what people had done, because they found stuff that has this written on it, like in museums, is not only had they gone, hey, let's set this one up to hedge our bets for the Astra folks. Like, let's do that. You know, so we got the Yahweh God, the Jesus, you know, this, this God, the one that we're worshiping now. You now let's add this other one in just in case, you know. It wasn't like that necessarily. What they found is that they were like, Yahweh, he's like the father. And Asherah, she's like the mother. And so they'd taken this holy thing that God had made, and they'd mixed it together with this other thing. And they found objects that say on them for Yahweh and his Asherah. As if this God, this fake God is God's wife. So they've done something which is called like syncretism. Where you take two things and you kind of synchronize them together. And this is where we really have to be careful. In our culture right now. Especially in the next two months. Is where we start to talk about something that isn't God. As if it is God. And we use the same words to describe it so that it's syncretized together. Do you, hear, do you hear what I'm saying? There is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Now shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. And this God is, is not his wife. And they try to make it fit together. We suffer from something called by sociologists Christian nationalism. And they defined it like this, a cultural framework, not a religious framework, a cultural framework. It's a collection of myths, traditions, symbols, narratives, and value systems that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity and American civic life. I'm going to read that again because you need to hear this. We suffer from a Christian nationalism, which is defined as a cultural framework, a collection of myths, traditions, symbols, narratives, and value systems that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. And there's a conservative and a liberal version of this that affect the church in our country. And if we're not on guard for it, we get sucked into it. Because like Josiah, we're just born into it. We don't know. But when you have the Word and you have God, you can tell the difference. But you're going to have to try. Because some Christian leaders are caught up in this. On the left side and on the right. And you have to be able to hear the difference between the two. (laughs) 
I think it's equal on both sides, okay? I think there's people that have syncretized conservative Republican politics with Christianity, and they've done an extremely good job of doing it. And I think there's people that have done the exact same thing with liberal and democratic views. And I think neither one of them reflect the heart of God, and neither one of them are worshiping Jesus totally. They've syncretized an idol worship in there. I'm not saying they're not believers, and I'm not saying that they're evil, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm just saying they're confused, all right? And it takes us to clean this stuff out of our house, okay? Because it's not my job to tell the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, like, hey, guys, wake up. This is a mess, you know? Like, they probably already know, you know? But my point is, my job is my house. Your job is your house. You see? Because what, this is what struck me. What gives an idol its power? Because when you read through the Bible, you're encountered with spiritual power that challenges our culture. Our spiritless culture. See? We're challenged by that. Because there's spirit, spiritual forces doing some stuff. Stuff we might call strange. <laughs> And uh, you see Jesus, and we should somewhat hear this as a rebuke against maybe our culture, but at least our practices as a church. Jesus sends out disciples several times, and one of the important things he says for them to do is to drive demons out of people. And he's not just meaning like, pray over people so they'll feel better. He means there's embodied spiritual forces of some kind messing with people and part of your job as a follower of him is to drive them out of people like you come into the situation and you make it better now look if you want to if it helps you to digest this to make it um symbolic that's okay it's not the best but that's even better because the thing is if you come into a situation and there's this, inten- this intensity and this anger and everything, our job is to make it better, okay? I do believe there are actual spiritual forces at play often because this is in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right all the way up to the end, okay? So I think we're living in that, and I think that's part of our job even now. When Jesus says, as you go, that's what he's talking about. But this is the difference between something like demon possession and idol worship. Demons might have power. We don't need to be afraid of them as followers of Jesus because we win, you see. Jesus wins and we win with him. So there's no need to go home and be afraid of that. Just because they might be real doesn't mean we need to be afraid. But if there is power like that, I would argue that idol worship is different because I would argue that idol worship, idols get their power not necessarily just from the evil of the world or whatever. They get the power from us. We give it to them. We worship them, and we give them our devotion, and therefore empower them, and they become God to us. So what happens in this story? Dude cleans the place up. We're all good, right? No. Because he reads this book, and he tears his clothes, and he says, oh my gosh, we're not doing any of this stuff. We're not doing what God wants. And he says, we need to figure out where we stand because as I read this stuff, it says God has his end of the deal. We have our end of the the deal. And God says, if you don't do your end of the deal, this stuff happens. And he goes, "Uh, we need to figure, like, we're not sitting good with this situation because all this bad stuff seems like it's going to happen to us now because the way I read it, we're not doing it right. It's simple. He's not going, well, maybe we can spiritualize it and make it all go away. He's like, this is a mess, you know. So he's like, we need to inquire of the prophet where we stand with God. So they go to meet. He sends some people. They go to meet with a prophet. And she, she, just making that note, she tells them that God sees what's going on. He sees Josiah's heart. And he accepts that. And he sees what he wants to do. And that it is pure. And he's, thank, he's happy for that. He's thankful for it. But he's still going to send the people into exile. He's like, but... Because I see what they're doing, I'm going to push it back till after you die. So you don't go through it. 
but it's still going to happen. So you're like, are you telling me the idle people win? The bad guys win? And I'd say, no. Because you can keep looking. And this connection I'm going to credit to a, another pa- a preacher named John Tyson who, found, who made this connection. I was like, gosh, he's so, this is right. Because you look, the book of Daniel, some of these prophets tell the story of Israel being sent to exile. And then the book of Daniel happens while they're there. Daniel, several other guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. If you look in Daniel 3, there's a whole story. The king in Babylon goes, you know what? It's about time we make an idol. And since he's king and super powerful, he doesn't have a little idol. He's got a huge idol. And it's nice, and it's gold, and it's fancy. And he's like, you know, everybody's going to worship this idol I made. And here's how they're going to do it. And so they do it. When you hear these, these sounds and, you know, you guys, I want everyone to worship this idol I've made. But word gets back to me. They're like, hey, you know, king, you know, there's a couple guys over here that aren't doing what you told them to do. And they're not like nobodies. They're kind of like important. They're, they're these Hebrew people you brought over that you put in charge of some stuff. They ain't following the rules. They're not bowing to your idol anymore. Or not ever. They're not buying, they're, they aren't bowing to it like the rest of us are. And the king says, bring them to me. And he's like, guys, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. You know, I got this furnace over here, and I'm going to throw you in it because you're not listening to me. You're not, you're not worshiping the fake God like I told you to. And they say back to him, you can read this, Daniel 3, 16 to 18. King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Because the king before that said, like, who could save you from me? I'm like the most powerful person in the world. And then they say this, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, (laughs) that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Where do you think they got the guts to do that? These aren't old people. Again, Young men, these aren't the oldest guys, you see. A lot of the Hebrew people chickened out and did it. These guys did. And if you know the end of the story, he throws them in the fire. But God shows up and saves them. And the king's like, whoa, <laughs> he gets freaked out, you know. But, so, but what gives them the guts to stand there like that? Well, I was listening, and John Tyson put this connection together. He's like, these guys were kids, When Josiah cleaned out Israel of all the idols. They saw that happen. And they watched and they were like, I'm never going back to that. I've seen that. It doesn't work. It has no power. That's not who God, you know, it doesn't matter what you say out here, culture. It doesn't matter, king, if you try to tell me I'm supposed to worship. It doesn't matter anything you're saying. Because I've been called by God to be something else. And he can save me if he wants to. And even if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow down to that. Because it's powerless. And I'm not afraid. So do we just worship Jesus as God because he says so? You see, like, is it just because he's God and there's nothing we can do about it? Is it just that? Like if we don't, he'll smash us? This is what's interesting. If you go back again, that Leslie Newbigin guy, he started talking about it. He's like, you know, this whole way, this whole secularist, post-enlightenment, post-modern way of thinking where your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, has confused people about what the gospel is because it's like in trying to respond to that, like people go, okay, culture is different now. And this isn't always happening consciously in people's heads, but they go, okay, we used to talk about Jesus this way. Jesus died, he rose from the dead, and because of that, you know, we worship him and and all this kind of thing, and he saves us from our sins and and like lay out this picture. But now people go, yeah, well, that's good for you. It doesn't work for me. They go, okay. Yeah, I guess that works. You don't believe it. 
And Leslie Newbegin was like, well, wait a minute. Like, whether or not somebody believes this doesn't affect whether or not it actually happened. Like, it's either a historical fact or it isn't. And so he started saying, he's like, you guys are getting confused. He's like, you're saying there's, he, he put it into two categories, facts and values. Meaning like, this is a fact. And in our culture, we say science is a fact. Like water boils at this temperature and it freezes at that temperature. You see? Well, that's just a fact at like normal pressure or whatever, you know. And then you come over here and go, this is the greatest movie of all time. You go, well, that's a value, you see. Or this is the best donut in town, you know. <laughs> Unless you're talking about the donut shop, then that's just a fact. But <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but he was saying, he's like, what we've done is we've moved. Um, I'll give you another example. So, like, if I said to you that it's day out, daytime outside, that's just a fact. Sitting here right now, it's observable. You can see it. It's a daytime outside. But if I said to you, it's a nice day outside, that's a value. You might go, well, I hate days like this. You know, like, this isn't a nice day. Like, what are you talking about? You see? So what he was saying is the gospel and what Jesus has done is a fact. But you guys are talking about it like it's a value. He's like, that doesn't make sense. He's like, because if it's a value... It's not a value worth having because it's ridiculous. He's like, it doesn't even work as a value. Like, the idea of talking about the gospel as a value doesn't even work. Like, the gospel isn't the gospel when you present it as a value. So you can't even say, well, that's what I believe, that's what you believe, and it doesn't matter. He's like saying, it only is and only ever will be a fact. And if it is a fact, it changes everything. And it matters more than anything in the entire world. This is his argument. He's written about it more than I've even read, but I plan to. And so you sit in um, trying to understand interaction with God and why and all this sort of stuff. If you've been reading this book with us, E. Stanley Jones is in a very similar category and age bracket. He's a little older than um, Leslie Newbegin was. But he also, he was American and he was a missionary to India for a very long time. And he wrote this book when he came back to America kind of to retire for medical reasons and stuff. And I find such agreement in what these guys are talking about because they spent their entire lives explaining to people who don't have a grid for what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he does, um, who he is and what he does, <laughs> or who he is and what he did, you know. And so in this book, right in the middle, I think he really gets at this about why we worship Jesus and why he's different. And why when you read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. and includes Jesus. And that's who we're worshiping. Why is that so different than somebody else who just happens to think something else? And he describes it like this. He says, take the, this matter of self-surrender. It's in the category of talking about surrendering ourselves. Because he's saying, as worshipers, it's just, it's happening. Like, we're going to surrender. Like, either to some idol that you made up, some politics, like I said earlier, or you'll actually find God. And he's saying this. Take this matter of self-surrender. God asks us to do that. And he quotes Romans. I implore you, therefore, to offer your very selves to him. Romans 12.1. He says, but does God do what he is asking us to do? Does he offer his very self? His answer is, Yes. Note the word, therefore. It points back to what Paul was saying in the previous chapters. And what was he saying? He was saying nothing less than God gave himself as a living sacrifice. And he quotes Romans 8 here. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And, and he also quotes 2 Corinthians. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God gave his son but he also gave himself in his son. The outer cross lights up the inner cross upon the heart of God. So if God asks us to surrender ourselves, this is not cruelty, but an invitation to share with him the deepest joy that this universe knows. The joy of saving others at a cost to oneself. The happiest people in the world are the people who deliberately take on themselves sorrow and pain to help others. 
Their hearts sing with a deep, wild joy. And the most miserable people in the world are the people who won't do a thing for anybody but themselves. They are automatically centers of misery. So the God of the kingdom of God is a God who will and does do everything he asks his subjects in the kingdom to do. I can love a God like that. Because what Leslie Newbegin was talking about as a fact is that what Jesus did on the cross, coming as a man, dying in, a, in the place of sinners, and breaking the power of sin and death. You see, Satan, like I was talking about these evil forces, they think they got him. Have you ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? It's the same, it's like a, a picture of the same story. The witch gets Aslan and it's like, ha, I win. I'm going to kill him. What, he didn't see this coming. And Aslan allows her, like Jesus allows himself to be killed on the cross in a horrible way. And then the next day, or in Jesus' case, in the real story, on the third day, he rose from the dead. So he's dead. He actually died. God died for us. And this single event broke history in a way that the evil powers didn't see coming. Like in the Chronicles of Narnia, they say, you know, like, but what about all that stuff? Like you died. And he's like, yeah, see, the witch, <laughs> she thinks she knows what's going on, but she doesn't. What she didn't know was that if you did a sacrifice on the stone table, it was unjust like that, that it would break it, and that death itself would start working backwards. And that's the world we live in now. And Jesus doing that revealed to us what God was like. And He's good. And He loves us. And He would have done that for each and every one of us by ourselves. We don't have time to be worshiping idols of politics. E. Stanley Jones is right. There's people counting on us. There's God is counting on you to live the life he's called you to. To stand when everybody else is worshiping the idol. And you can do it. And you will do it. But we get caught up because the culture is worshiping idols in the temple of God. See, the temple is a place of God's presence. When Jesus dies on the cross, something amazing and powerful happens that the, uh, like I said, it's a building. It's an actual place. You can still go in Jerusalem right now to the area where the temple was. This is not make-believe stuff. There are stones still there that were part of that. I was talking with Steve and Mary, and they lived in Israel for a long time. James and Martina lived in Israel a long time. And they've seen it. I've seen it. You can go there. And uh, I'm trying to find this verse. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so... So this temple, the God has set this up. This like this is where my presence is going to rest, okay? But then when Jesus comes and does what he does, which is a single, unrepeatable event, okay? What Jesus did is something only God could do, and only God did it. That's why we're worshiping him. And at that moment, you can read in the gospel, in the temple across town, which is this building that God has set up, for his presence. And there's different courts to get more holy as you go in. And there's this one holy of holies and all of this. And it's separated through curtains and all sorts of different things. And when Jesus dies on the cross, this gigantic curtain is ripped in half by God, like the table cracking. And he's like, my presence doesn't have to be here anymore. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Sounds like Josiah, right? But look at this. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So at that moment, we become 
this very temple of God. And Jesus says to the disciples, wait, I'm going to send a helper, the Holy Spirit, to fill you. And they, he does. And so the presence of God can go with us. So I thought like, these three words stuck out to me. Um, and I, I definitely think it's the Lord because I don't like things like this because it's alliteration. I think it's cheesy. But when you say, like, well, what do we do? Um, I had three P words that came to me, which are like a focus. And I think we'll get into some of these um, more in the coming weeks, um, maybe coming months, maybe coming years. I don't know. But prayer, communion and time with God. And in that presence of God where he changes us and we allow him to move. And then through that, we find the power of God, the Holy Spirit through us, where we are courageous enough to stand even if everyone around us is willing to bow to the idols of the culture. So, band, let's come on up here. We're going to sing this song, which I think celebrates all of this, and it also, um, it also celebrates what Jesus did and why he's worthy of our worship. And it's the This Is Love song because it describes this whole thing, I think, in a nutshell. And I'm going to pray um, that this has spoken to you. Um, I might come back to some of this in a couple of weeks and clear it up if I didn't get it very well, but I think it's very important in this next two-month season where in the category of religious devotion to politics, we're going to be challenged. We're going to be challenged by our family. We're going to be challenged by our friends. We're going to be challenged by our religious leaders. We're going to be challenged by famous Christian people whatever that means. And we're going to be challenged just by the, the events themselves to become idol worshipers and to syncretize our politics with the kingdom of God. And we must resist that. And we can resist that. And if you're, if you're thinking that I'm telling you who to vote for, I am absolutely not. I will never do that. It's not appropriate for me to do that, and I would never do that. And if you think I'm telling you not to vote, I'm not telling you that either. I think you should vote. I think you should pray about who you should vote for, and I think you should do what you feel best doing. But I think that you need to see it in the category of what it is. We have a country where we have the freedom to vote, and that's wonderful. And we should execute that freedom. And you have the country to decide yourself who you think the President of the United States or whoever else we're electing could be. But the moment you start to attribute to that person devotion or anti-devotion to the level of worship, you're starting to get somewhere that's not a good place. I don't know where that is. But I've seen examples of it recently. So let's stand, let's sing this song. Father, we commit ourselves to be people who worship you and you alone. We want to be people who are of your kingdom and your unshakable kingdom and your unshakable person. And we know that your kingdom come, your will be done, no matter who is the president of the United States. And we will not hate people who vote opposite from us. And we will not bow to that idol. God, give us patience. Let us be people of your presence, people of prayer, and people of the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now sing this with me.